speeches and people need to come with a big hook and yank it off the, off the stage. I'm, um, I'm privileged to be invited <coughs> to, uh, to speak at a festival um, commemorating these martyrs of uh, the working class. Um, a fixed monument to, um, or a plaque to the memory <coughs> of these workers is long overdue, long overdue. Um, especially on the wall of York Castle, where 15 of them were publicly executed. Perhaps, um, really, as a theme from, from rising from this festival, we should set up a campaign, as there already is one, to actually have a permanent monument made, um, or at the very least, see if we can motivate a heritage lottery funding and a community funding to get a proper blue plaque put on the uh, wall. Um, at your castle, and if the powers that be will not see to that demand, then we should make our own blue plaque and inscribe it with the details and super glue it onto the wall and continue to super glue it onto the wall until somebody puts it there properly. Um, so, too, maybe um, in the villages and towns across Yorkshire and Nottingham and Lancashire where workers were shot and hanged by the dozen, including young workers of 12 years old. Hundreds were shot down, unknown numbers deported and imprisoned to unknown fates. So the memories of the, uh, memory of the Luddites needs to be preserved and preserved for what they were and what they did and not to have their name uh, used as a misnomer or an expression of ignorant misrepresentation of what they were about. I've become sick and tired over the years of hearing labour movement platforms and socialist platforms hear speakers saying, well, I'm not a Luddite, but, <laughs> you know, Luddite is seen as a, a movement of people who are against change, who are against science, who are against innovation, technological progress. Well, it's bad enough, you know, that people with their backs to the wall who have heroically defied authority and paid the ultimate price are actually slaughtered and seen their families slaughtered, but also the cause in which they fought for is seized and assassinated um, in a vulgar way. Because the people who describe themselves as Luddites, of course, didn't believe any of the things which had been attributed to them. These were skilled workers whose brawn and dexterity were highly prized in the labour market when it was needed. Skilled workers per se are also misrepresented grossly by modern labour historians and by ultra-left revisionists who um, see these workers as somehow incorporated into the, uh, into the system. Uh, the self-selection -select process of defence of their skill at the cost of non-skilled workers. It's as much a myth as the title of the Luddite one. Skilled workers, because of the control of select skills, set benchmarks of wages and conditions to which workers right down the scale graduate. Um, because of their strong association and their, their uh, strategic position, um, they've often been used um, as a means of assisting non-skilled or general workers uh, right across the labour movement. And, you know, the old records and minute books of the early craft unions are full of examples of financial, big financial support to non-skilled unions and general unions. 
um, as well as you occasionally find the occasional barrel of gunpowder, uh, which often was laid by as the next tactic um, had all else failed. Um, it's largely to skill and drive down wages and conditions and create a downward spiral that's grist to the mill of discovery uh, and machine innovation. These machines aren't seized on by the mill owners to benefit humanity or progress or science, but to drive down cost and super enrich profit at the great expense of the labour market as a whole. The whole concept of apprenticeships tightly under the control of workers' organisations is to regulate the supply of labour, to maintain levels of skill in order not to flood the labour market and collapse hard for wages. Um, the sheer croppers with the muscles of Garth and the eyes of, uh, of an eagle brought huge five and six foot long scissors to crop the cloth um, polyps as they rolled over the, uh, over the rollers. Now displaced by a mechanical cropper, the stock and frames displaced thousands of men and women in skilled occupations and entire villages and small towns upon which small towns and villages were dependent. Marx described in Capital how the handloom weavers forming a deputation to meet the principal mill owners in Yorkshire request not the displacement of spinning and weaving machines, nor their de-invention, but their gradual introduction to give the families and communities a chance to move over to new technologies and innovations, to have them gradually introduced alongside hand-woven, hand-spun products. The vindictive response of the owners, and Marx picks out Arkwright in particular, is that no concessions will be made. And the men who made their fortunes and families, um, who made them their fortunes um, and their families will, <coughs> will literally be starved to death before their eyes. There's no redundancy payments, of course, no dole, no income support, there's nothing. And in a parish that's starving, there's no parish relief. These machines equal not progress, but death, literally starvation and destitution to death. With the choice between machines and super profits of the owners, or death and destitution, the working population on a mass scale uh, had, what, had an answer which was correct then and correct now. The spread of the machines threw out of work the skilled and craft linchpins of wage levels. General wages workers crashed, wheat prices were rising, and with, and with no money to feed the family, even where a man and his family were working, starvation and literal starvation was on the cards. Rebellion and riot weren't just, a, of course, a response to hardship. They were also frequently cheek by jowl, a method of collective industrial relations by other means. Luddites, of course, hadn't been unique. The uh, Tyneside Keelmen had an unwritten nostrum, and a strike wasn't much good without a riot and sabotage going along with it. Um, and for 200 years, God knows, the miners well practiced that particular code. The keelmen had been poised over the jugular of coal export for more than a century, rolled great coal barges down the downstream and hand filling coal into the coal ships of the world, more importantly to London. The ships and the, the ship owners and the coal owners tried for half a century or more to displace the labour with coal states, where the coal was shot down chutes directly into, into the, um, into the uh, sailing colliers rather than have them transported by the, by the keelmen. For 50 or 60 years, the keelmen had blockaded the port, they'd blown up the states, and so imposed their own rate of progress for, the, for, this, um, for this invention. In uh, 1793, they took the opportunity of a general coal, riverside and seamen strike to board and capture the Royal Navy ship Eleanor, and to free the whole company of press gang sailors from every port in Britain. This was followed by a general strike of Royal Navy ratings on the time, demanding fresh food, sanitary conditions, and restoration of the old wage rates. The time being a principal port for warships, and this being the middle of a Napoleonic war, to say, uh, the, the, to say that those seamen had the edge, not least, of course, because they also had the cannons. In the midst of the Luddite period between 1815 and 20, there were uprisings in every major industrial town in Britain. It culminated on the time with the land stick of 1822 with the keelmen in armed rebellion against the Royal Navy and the Marines, 
Seven principal ships of the line lay off shields, while gunboats pointed broadsides of cannon at Sandgate, the ghetto of Tyneside Rebellion for a century. But the Luddite earthquake is followed rapidly by the aftershock as Ned Ludd is replaced by Captain Swing. And between 1831 and 33, local and regional insurrections sweep the country as masses of people are seen possessing the moors and dales, tearing down fences, occupying and working the land, tearing down the enclosures. Castles, palaces, mansions, customs houses, garrisons were burned down, jails were liberated and armed miners exchanged gunfire with yeomanry and put them to flight. Capitalists and captains were assassinated, cotton towns and coal towns launched general strikes, rick burning and incendiarism set agricultural areas ablaze in fire and rebellion. Iron workers and miners seized Merthyr and put the troops to flight. Riots reached the cities with the Reform Bill. Into this great period is born Chartism, the first working class revolutionary party. Echoes of the Luddites reverberate through to modern day, to the Dockers fights against, against um, containerization and in particular non-union containerization, to the printers of Fleet Street and the war against Wapping, and to the great minor struggles of 8485 and 9293. Struggles to stop de-skilling, to hold the benchmarks of safety and conditions in union organisation and workers' control, and a challenge to the system. That we failed, and that that work is now produced, ironically, not by more modern and more efficient systems, and not in safer and more technological conditions, but in conditions with death and injury rates equivalent to those of the 19th century mines, in China and in India and in Colombia. It demonstrates what this whole process is about. 70 million tonnes of coal are imported, imported here for use, while 60,000 unemployed miners still sit on the scrap heap in wretched and wrecked communities. 6,000 miners a year die in China, possibly 600,000 dead or dying from lung diseases. But the lesson of the Luddites can fly oceans, and the lessons of the Luddites can, can, can be learned. Coal in China now represents 75% of all energy production, and the Chinese miners, given determined and free independent rank and file unions, are poised over the jugular of the Chinese economy and political power. The lessons learned by the British miners in the 19th century um, can be relearned. Um, and the, that message was that if they're going to be slaughterous and with thousands at work in the cause of profits, we might as well risk death on the streets in the cause of our own social conditions. Evidence from China tells us that thousands of strikes rage every week, that hundreds of local rebellions rage every week, that full-scale insurrections happen and bosses and troops and police are killed and equipment wrecked. Ned Ludd with Chinese characteristics, you could say. Finally, we shouldn't compound the mistakes of misunderstanding of Luddism with a misunderstanding of industry. The Luddites were not the enemies of industry, and industry is not the enemy of humanity. Industry is the sum total of our physical capacity to create real wealth, food, housing, clothing, warmth, transportation, leisure, comfort, science, with the minimum of forced expenditure of labour and cost to our health and welfare. Industry and our productive capacity is an ally to the needs of humanity. It must be a servant of the working class worldwide, uh, and not its master, uh, and I think that is the lesson that we can take from Luddism into today. Wow, and ahead of time as well. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, given that, actually, I think, uh, if you don't mind, maybe we'll have like about a few questions now. Uh, if anybody's got any, um, and then uh, we'll have a main dis discussion and question period will be after uh, Paul and Theo have spoken, but if anybody's got a quick one for Dave now or wants to make a quick point, then uh, why not? Uh, doesn't look like it, does it? Have to wait for more. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. Uh, in that just case, one question. Uh, okay. Your transformation from a miner to a, a writer, to somebody who tries to 
put the ideas that have obviously been going through your head all the time you're working in the mines to um, to a wider audience. Did that occur as a gradual process, or was it one particular thing? I'm thinking maybe of, of a minor strike or something like that that made you think that you've got to uh, spread the message that you want to spread um, to a wider audience to, to sort of avoid misunderstanding. Uh, no, I started writing while I was working in the pit. Yeah. Um, the first books were published while I was working in the pit. Yeah. Um, a Miner's Life was published in 1977, I think. Yeah, so it's, um, it's been a, a gradual thing. Yeah. It's not been one I've never been able to spell, mate, that's the downside, but yeah. you know, <laughs> you can't ever read it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, any more now? It's, yeah, go on. It's, it's Tower Colliery, and it's uh, resurrection as a work of co op. Is that a model that is seen, held as a, a positive? Um, well, we, there was moves here to, um, to have a workers' cooperative um, um, at Kilnurst, I think. Um, I, I can't remember which, which pit it was in South Yorkshire, with the support of the council. And Arthur and the, and the Yorkshire area was dead against any cooperative. Um, for good reasons, really, in, in many ways. I mean, one, we tried them before in the early 19th century and that ended in disaster. Um, the South Wales experience was a different one in, in that it embodied um, a national identity question as well as it being the last pit in Wales and also having um, the power station was prepared to buy everything they produced. Now, having done all that, and the workers put in 8,000 quid of their own money each, which was a fair whack. Um, and the, all of the political parties in Wales rallied behind it. It was a very specific thing. But the work tower colliery, until they worked every nut of coal out of there, and never had a single fatality, and never had any serious accidents. Now, in Scotland, a workers' cooperative ended with deaths, serious injuries, and bankruptcy, and the men lost every penny they put in the way. So, it just depends. It's horses for courses, you know. But as an example of workers running the industry, well, we've always more or less run the industry at pit level. But, you know, it's, it's the man down the pit that makes those decisions, really. Um, it's it's, the, it's the, 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 econo the gross economics, the macroeconomic part that we've never been able to get our hands of control over, you know. I wonder if you had, had any thoughts about what happened to Neil Gratterix this week. Well, I'm delighted, of course. Um, but um, could you just explain that, Richard, to people? Uh, well, I'd, I'd let David well, explain. Great Trex was one of Thatcher's um, plants that was put there to lead the the scab movement in Nottingham. Um, it was set up before the strike, of course. Nothing to do with the rebellion against not having a ballot. They put that in place before we <laughs> went on strike. Um, and he created the Union of Democratic Miners, haha, um, as an alternative to, to the NUM. And they gave us some pain and caused us a terrific amount of disorganization after the strike, um, insofar as they had a majority of miners in Nottingham, um, only in Nottingham, uh, that were behind them. He's recently been sent to jail, last, yesterday been sent to jail for four years, um, for having been caught with his fingers in the till, um, having creamed off 150,000 quid from the retired miner's home, uh, where he was a trustee. Um, but I will say, people in Glasgow's issue, Hoy Bricks, um, and the NUM has not been totally faultless in terms of some of the excessive salaries and financial shenanigans that have gone on in the NUM either. Not as bad as them, perhaps, <laughs> but um, bureaucratic organisations do tend to lend itself to that kind of activity. Okay, thanks. Uh, oh, can I ask you a general question? Uh, I think let's let's leave it now until okay. the end because uh, I'd, yeah, I want us to keep moving on. With them. Hmm. Yes. My name's Paul Holmes. I'm the branch secretary of Kirklees Unison, which is the third largest branch of Unison in Britain. It's got 11,000 members, and uh, I'm on the national executive of Unison. Uh, 
and I, I would have used to death about Greater Exeter, I don't know about anybody else. But it won't get the publicity that the alleged money flowing into the NUM during the 84 fire strike on the road got. And, and let's not forget that it, the legal money that Great earned. In 1987, his salary was £63,000 a year as the president of the UDM. £63,000. That was a big wage in 1987, it's a big wage now. And it was £110,000 a year when he retired in 2009. So he ain't a bloke who's skidding the bottom of the, the, the sea, he's, he's, he's had plenty of money. And what I want to talk about really is, is, it, is I think it's our job to remember things. As you get older, you know, you stop criticising your parents and you start quoting them. And that's one of the signs of getting old, really. And, and I remember speaking to me, my great grandmother about my great granddad who, who uh, went to fight in the Boer War when, when he was 13 years old. And I said, it must have been a big shock for him leaving school to go and fight in South Africa in the Boer War. And she said, Paul, he'd been down the pit since he was six. <laughs> and, and you need to know these things, don't you? You need to know where you've come from. And I remember coming home from school, I tell this story often, but I remember it in 1966, and coming home to see my grandparents who were looking after me during the school holidays, and saying, uh, we've got to pray for Winston Churchill tonight. Cause he's, and this, my grandma said, why? He says, because he's really ill. And she says, he's not as ill as he would be if I could get my bloody hands on him. <laughs> and, 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 that, and that's where we come from, really. And, when the industrial level, you know, when, we, when I heard about a school, it's, I don't often quote Winston Churchill, but one of his quotes I, I quite like really, which is, my, my education was interrupted by my schooling. <laughs> and I, I learned all sorts of things at school were completely untrue and spent the first five years at work unlearning a lot of things that I'd learned at school. And one of the things I, I, I was taught to me was the anarchism, the, the negativism, the backwardism of the Luddites. And no mention of what were happening. Absolutely no mention. The fact, the most common word used at that time was horsepower. The fact that human beings were being yoked to iron and steam. That's what was happening. And they started off before the 1800s with women and children. In 1802, Robert Peel, who was a mill owner, and just like today, Cameron and Clegger bankers, the people who owned society like to make the laws in society as well, in 1802, Robert Peel, as Home Secretary, brought in legislation which limited the working week for children to 73 hours. Which said that children couldn't sleep more than two a bed and that all children at work must, relieve, must receive religious education. And all factories had to be inspected by both the magistrate and the vicar to make sure that these things were happening. Now, you, nobody ever taught me that at school. Never, nobody ever taught me that sort of thing. Nobody ever taught me. That the law at that time, until 1806, 1809, said that apprentices and workers had proper rights. There was all sorts of legislation that allowed that. And it was only in 1809, as a response from the mill owners to what was going on in the background of the industrial society at that moment in time, that they got rid of all that legislation, all the protections that Dave talked about. And it doesn't take long, does it, to look for connections. Connections are very interesting. He's finding them because reporters aren't interested in reporting them. Because the, the money that Greatrex got out of that charity fund will be nothing compared to the money that were flowing about in 84 5 and subsequent to that from the Freedom Association and all sorts of other people that were so dead keen on getting democratic rights for mine workers. They won't be keen on prosecuting where things are going at this moment in time. You know, and, you, know you go back to the total puddle matters, you know, used against the law rights was the combination laws of 1799 and 1800. But their very combination of the laws were used against the toll puddle matters. The secret oaths were used against the toll puddle matters. The magistrate who sentenced them was also a landowning farmer, just like happened all through these executions that took place. And I can't read about what happened to the other day sometimes. It's so heartbreaking, isn't it? You know, 12 year olds being executed and calling for the mother as they're being executed. And that was the situation that existed. And how did they respond? They responded as working people always respond. A, the media castigates them, whether it's the Stockport Messenger, whether it's the, the, the minor strike of 84, the doctor's strike, whether it's at Grunwick. Who else died this week? George Ward died this week. Hmm. For those in this room, remember the owner of Grunwick. He died this week. A person, I, as an Asian, I assumed, because he was an Asian, would be connected to the workforce, but it, it, it's to, I, I'm interested to find out that he was Anglo-Indian and chair of the British Catholic Anglo-Indian Anglo Society. 
And there was also a leading Tory in the area who was expelled from the Tory party for nefarious activities in the last 10 years. And these people were put forward as innocents. You know, they were put forward as people who we should be trying to protect. You know, he only wanted to employ some people. Great tricks only wanted democracy, democracy for minors. But it's not true. And what happens is why I'm here to speak today is no different in 1815 or 1814. What happened? They had the Corn Laws in, keeping the price of bread up. They had foreign governments at, in, in economic crisis. They had Napoleon all over Europe. Napoleon no different to the United States' position in the world at this moment in time. Prices were rising, wages were being driven down. What's changed? I'm brand secretary in Kirklees now, when I go and see management, and all they ever talk about is shedding the workforce, increasing the working week, buying more equipment. I went down to speak at Southwark Branch, I don't know if people know where Southwark Branch is. Southwark's on the, so, so, so on the, so, the southern walk of the Thames, it's on the edge of the city, it's where the Gherkin is. And I spoke at their annual general meeting last year of Southwark Unison, and there was 3,000 people working in five offices in one building. There were 600 in each office. No desks, no coats, no photographs, no nothing. It was a white collar factory. That's all it is. And if you go and try and pay your rent anywhere now, you can't because there's no cash offices. You have to pay it direct to the bank through your wages, through a direct debit, through a standing order. There's a massive industrialisation taking place. The white collar, when I started off going in 1973, <coughs> it was seen as a good job. You've got to, my father, who'd been an industrial worker all his life, said, you've got, a, you've got the one thing I want my son to have, a job with a good pension and job security. Try telling that to local government workers in the middle of a pensions dispute when redundancies are everywhere and 90% of the workforce would take redundancy if they could afford to take it. And what's changed? I think that's the purpose of my speech today. Not to, I, I can't possibly be an expert on that period. I'm not an expert, I don't pretend to be. But I do pretend to know, I do know ordinary working people. I do know the circumstances that they're buying. And what Mark said is true. It's no different today as it was when he wrote it. They are trying to speed up white collar workers. That's all we ever hear. We've got to produce more services with less people for less money. Everybody in local government has heard that from some manager in the last 10 years. <coughs> you wouldn't equate industrial factory workers with what was it, to some extent a white collar bureaucracy 30 or 40 years ago. But they're no different. The people I represent in the 20s and 30s today, men and women, have a sons and grandsons and daughters and granddaughters of blue collar workers. They too would have been in factories. They too would have been in pits. They too would have been in engineering if Thatcher, in the great battle against the miners, hadn't won the battle to export jobs abroad. And you hear, and you hear, don't you, that there's 50% unemployment of under 26 year olds in Spain today and 24.4% unemployment of all adults. Unemployment in Germany this week is the lowest it's been for 22 years. It's lowest since the East, since the war, the Berlin Wall came down. There's virtually no inflation in Germany. And yet, all you hear is the bad news. The economies of Spain, the economies of Portugal, and the economies of Ireland are in just a pick, bigger pickle as the economy of Greece is in. And there's one, Greece is just playing one role at this moment in time. They're saying to everybody else, if you don't do as you're told, this is what we're going to do to you. We'll massacre your pensions, we'll massacre your wages, we'll massacre your trade union rights. And Gandhi said, and another person I don't often quote Gandhi, poverty is the worst form of violence. And if you haven't been in poverty, you don't know what it means. Because all Labour politicians talk about is people on benefits. Now I am got great sympathy and empathy for people on benefits, because they're but for the grace of God, go all working people. But Labour politicians will not talk about the working poor, because they're the people who are suffering as well at this moment in time. People who don't know how to pay the bills, people who don't know how to get a house, people who think they're going to get the, the pension when they're 77 or 78. And I'm going to use the C word, because it's banned on the BBC. The C word is the word you can't use. Class. You're not allowed to use that word. No Labour politician uses it. Nobody on the television in the media uses it. But that, class alongside capitalism, are the two key words that exist in Britain. And they're the two key words that 
cover the old ice. Now, if you go to Wakefield, I've lived in Wakefield now for 45 years. And I'm a citizen of Wakefield, I'm proud to be from Wakefield, it's a proud mining area, engineering area, textile area. But even I didn't know, and I bet the majority of people in this room didn't know, that if you went to the back of Westgate Station in Wakefield, within 10 yards of the car park is a monument to the Chartists. The, the ordinary people of Wakefield collected money for, and it's there the monument, and it's, it's built and built and built, and it's broken at the top. And they said, we're not going to build the rest of it, till we get the one more aim that we didn't get, which was annual elections. We wanted parliaments, we wanted universal suffrage, but we wanted annual parliaments, and it's there. But what was in the middle of the Wakefield when I was growing up was a statue of Queen Victoria that the Labour Council put there. And what was hidden in the bush behind Westgate Station is a monument to where we come from, ordinary working people, the working class of this country. And the Luddites, that's all they were. They were fighting against death. Being sent to Australia were worse than dying at that moment in time. And nobody ever explained to me that the only reason Britain sent people to Australia was America had got independence. They had to stop sending them to the United States, so they had to start sending them to Australia. And I've studied that period of the American Civil War. Very interesting period. One of two things that I found very useful. I saw an interview with a slave in 1861 in Mississippi. And they said, this bloke said to her, I don't understand this, I've just been to the main prison in Mississippi. There's no black people in the prison. Why is that? And they're philanthropic towards black people. She says, only unemployed people are put in prison. They bought us, they whip us and send us back to work if we've done anything wrong. And I'd never thought about that. Absolutely never thought about it. The Mississippi State Legislature in 1861, sorry, in 1871, after the Civil War, the first proclamation they made was to have the emancipation of ordinary people in Mississippi, we need to operate a brand new system of prisons. What would George Orwell have thought of that? Your emancipation is going to be achieved by a country now that has more people in prison than any other country in the world. And Dave made a reference earlier on to health and safety. It's Workers Memorial today, day to day, all over the world, where we recognise ordinary working people. The death rate among coal miners in Britain is higher than it is in China. The percentage death rate today is higher. Miners to death is bigger than it is in China. So if there's 6,000 miners die in China, there's a million miners in China, the death rate is higher here. It's the highest it's ever been since the coal board were nationalised after the war. And let's not forget, I draw my remark to a conclusion, let's not forget what we're about. We're about increasing and looking after the ordinary commonwealth of ordinary people. My best definition of socialism I've ever heard, there's no such thing as an economic crisis. All you've got is what you produce and how you divvy it up. That is all. That is what the world's about. And they've decided by their economic trick, because that's all capitalism is, an economic trick, that they haven't got a big enough divvy. And they want to divvy it up more. And the average wealth of the richest 1% is twice what it was 10 years ago. Harold Macmillan was right, but he was right 50 years earlier. They've never had it so good. They have absolutely never had it so good. And how do they get it so good? They get it from doing the same as they did to ordinary working people in this country in the 1790s. They say to ordinary working people, you've got to work longer, you've got to get less, and if you die, I don't care. And I think it's really important. That's what the health and social care bill is about. I don't care if you die. You're of no use to me. There is some advantage in indenture and slavery. At least somebody has a vested interest in keeping you alive. Under capitalism, they hire you for 8, 9, 10, 11 hours a day, and they don't give an F if you die when you're, they don't employ you, because it's not their responsibility. Cameron, his grandfather was a millionaire banker. He's, his, his father was a millionaire banker. Clegg's father was a, is a millionaire banker. And his grandfather was a millionaire banker. There's all this exposure to Murdoch. It's the funniest thing that's happened, isn't it, for years. He's getting his own back on him, isn't he? If you play with the devil, he'll get the own back on you. I want to see the photograph of Tony Blair when he became the godfather to, to Murdoch's son the other year in the all-white suit on the River Jordan. No photographs of that in the sun or the Daily Mirror and undercover reportage. Plenty of hacking of the deaths of teenage children, but no pictures of Tony Blair blessing the king of media capitalism in Britain and the world. Rupert Murdoch, 
who was at one point a Lithuanian, one point an Australian, one point a Briton, one point American, and no doubt very soon he's all but a Chinese. <laughs> he is whatever he needs to be to maximise profits. That's what he, he has no country. He only wants to talk about you having nationalism. And I went to Selby. The, we used to have four BNP councillors in, in Kirkley. He's in the, I'm pleased to say that God, there's no BNP standing this time. But I went to Selby to campaign against the BNP. And there was a farmer in Selby with two Union Jacks in his front garden. He was their BNP candidate. And he got 12 Polish workers working in his garden centre behind his farm. And that's the hypocrisy that they live under. They send children to the death. They execute them, they send them to the death in these horror mills. And then they set up charities to look after children. And then bloody charities like Bernardo's send kids to Australia for cheap labour in the 50s and 60s. It's all hypocrisy. And I think we should commemorate these people because these premier people were our forefathers and our foremothers who fought to keep them from poverty. The worst form of violence. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll, we'll move straight on to Theo now. Do you, do you want to use this, Theo? Okay. Yeah, I might as well now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, it's been, uh, it's been great to hear those two videos because it puts it, really reminds us what the Luddites were about. The way I came to the Luddites actually wasn't, wasn't directly through the labour movement and through understanding the history of that. It was more because I was in a group of people getting called Luddites in the 90s. And that was because we were doing things, first of all, we were trying to stop roads being built in parts of, uh, particularly in the south, it was, it was the main place that was happening. And uh, we found, you know, through the road protest and what we discovered after a while, it came over from ideas from activists in America originally, was that you could actually go out at night if all else was failing, you could go out at night to where the diggers are being kept and you could do things to it, which meant they never ran again. And that kind of tactic actually started to be used. And then, we also started to get into then, because I was coming at it from an environmental point of view, when the biotechnology was, uh, when they first started to test GM crops, we thought, well, what can we do? The obvious thing to do is to go out and pull them up. And then we decided, because we live in a very liberal country, if the truth be told, I mean, we're not going to get shot for doing it as you would in other countries, but we would go out publicly and pull up the crops. Sometimes we do it at night when no one was around because we didn't want to get arrested, but sometimes we do it to make a point and get arrested. And in the end, I don't know if you remember, what actually happened in the 90s was that by the end of that period, um, when people didn't want the GM crops, they would go en masse into a field and the police would just stand there and let it happen. And at that point, you kind of knew that that particular campaign had won because even the cops were thinking, yeah, I'm not sure about this dodgy food either. And no one wanted to prosecute. And the whole thing, temporarily at least, was, was put on the back burner. Although it's trying to come back now, which I'll get on to. And so I came into that through discovering direct action, which for me was very empowering, which, which was, if I'm not happy about something and I've got big corporations, big interests, and I'm in a society where, let's face it, since the defeat of the miners and since that subsequent period under Thatcher, then the ability to call on the labour movement and on workers' organisations to defend the environment was severely curtailed, then it came down to, what can we do? What can this community do? And I, I really learned through that that you could actually go out and do something yourself. It was just a matter of crossing a certain line, which is the line the Luddites crossed, which is a line that I don't think existed for them, but their defeat established in the minds of all of us, which is property and industrial technological processes can't be interrupted by people. You don't have permission to do it, and it's owned by someone, and it is bad to do it. So we were called Luddites in the way that Dave was saying, that way that is an insult to the name of the Luddites and the memory of the Luddites. And it was just like, you're Luddites. So we decided to embrace it. We found out about the history of the Luddites. And then since then, I've come to understand more about them. But they didn't really exist as this kind of small group of people who said, oh, look, this technology, we've got to go and destroy it. That it was a continuation of working class struggle. It was just something that people did. What was brilliant about the Luddites was that someone had the idea in Nottingham, the group of evidently of knitters had the idea, let's start a campaign where we say, it's General Ludd who's doing it, let's, let's use a method which can be replicated by people in the textile industry up and down the country can say, as soon as, as they're bringing the frames in or they think the owner's going to bring in the frames, send them a letter, sign it from General Ludd, 
which meant that no one was responsible. They never knew who was doing it. But it, it helped to build a sense of a movement because we all we all had a common identity. We were all under General Ludd. It was our army, and it was a it was something different. Because on the way up here from Somerset, I was reading about the same tactics being used in Wiltshire, where I grew up, Trowbridge, being used by people against the gig frames and the the Y frames, which were used by the the workers there that we were called the shearmen, which is the same as the croppers up here in Yorkshire, and that they were having to go out and smash up machines before that. And there were lots of sporadic, uh, like Dave was saying, it wasn't a new tactic. In fact, whenever people are up against the wall and something, a process is being brought in that they have to resist, when all else fails, then the tactic is you go and break it. That is, that is a basic tactic that's been used by people in struggle throughout history. And the Luddites, like I say, what I think happened there was they brought that struggle, came to a new level because things had come to a head. And that generation, mainly of young workers, really understood that they had to make it a general struggle because they were up against it. And they were right because, as we know, their defeat actually signalled the beginning of the, the whole industrialisation pro process on such a large scale. And now we're at the end of that 200 years. Now, it suited the owners to characterise the Luddites as you know, even the cartoons, even the pictures, it's sad in a way that the only pictures we have to commemorate the Luddites from that time are the kind of punch cartoons which make them look like these wild, dangerous people, not like the people they were, disciplined people who, I mean, when you, when you hear about, when I was studying this recently and realised when they talk about the food riots, what they were actually doing, people, was going into, in Manchester and Stockport and in Leeds, was going into the market, confiscating the stalls, and then saying this food goes out for this price because this is a fair price. They weren't even stealing the food, they were just trying to establish that principle. But they were coming from a place, and this is what I think now, looking back, where before the whole industrialisation process has happened, before that terrible process that of the first 30 or 40 years of that particularly <coughs> happened, working people had a, still had some control over their work, they still had control over their time, and they still had some control over their skills. And so they had a different sense of who they were. So they could say, we put down all machinery injurious to the commonality. The commonality being the common interest. And they thought they had a legitimate case to make. Well, now if you stand up and say that, it's just like, well, that's just socialism or something. That's not even, we don't, we don't think like that anymore. We've got to enrich each individual and maximise their opportunities to enrich themselves. The cream will rise to the top and we'll all benefit. That is now the dominant ideology, as you know. Now, we're 200 years on. And from my point of view, what's happened is, part of that, it's been very liberating for, for us, and let's face it, you know, working, the working class of the West has benefited from that process in the end. But now we're at the point where we're up against the limits of the, the ecological limits of that system. And we, we have now, through that coal-driven, uh, fossil fuel-driven development that happened, we're now at the point where our climate is changing, where the future food production of the world is in danger, where the future generation security is in danger. And we're a very, very real place of jeopardy now. And you could say that the commonality, the collective commonality, in other words, the interest of all the people on the planet, is now under threat. And actually of all species and all the other life forms, which I consider to be part of our commonality too, because ultimately we evolved from them and with them, and they are as much a part of our lives as everything else. All of that is now under threat, and we are faced with, well, where do we go from here? And the book was recently published by someone who erstwhile was a comrade of mine when uh, we were staking at GM Fields about 20 years ago, who's now become a, a spokesperson, I'd say, for the new technologies. A guy called Mark Linus, who wrote a book called The God Species recently, in which he was saying, we, we need to actually now have new technology to get out of this situation. We need nuclear power everywhere because that's the only way we're going to get enough power quick enough and, 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 and basically it's the only way that the system is ready to go with. We need GM biotech, we need biotechnology everywhere. We need to redesign nature because basically nature isn't going to deliver quickly enough. We've now got to redesign it. We have the science, we have the technology, we have the expertise, we are like gods. Let us now act as gods and take control of it. And all of that is just rubbish as far as I'm concerned because he's not aware of the social context of what he's talking about. I've come up from Somerset where I'm involved in the campaign to stop a new nuclear power station being built uh, at Hinkley Sea. 
We thought we'd beaten that in the 80s. There was a public inquiry, it was beaten. What's happened now is there's a new nuclear programme instigated by the Blairites and now being carried through by the Tories. And that programme, basically, now to bring those things through, they've changed the planning laws, so now you don't get a chance to have a public inquiry. There's something called a national commission. They look into it, they say, well, it's national policy. Believe it or not, these people down there, we're looking at a nuclear power station being built next to Bridgewater and the parishes there. And the people cannot question radioactivity, they can't question nuclear waste, and they can't question the need for a nuclear power station. Those three things are not allowed to be discussed in the planning because it's national policy and you don't discuss national policy. It's actually outlawed. So we're faced with a situation where we have to try and stop something, but we can't discuss its environmental impact. Now, in that situation, you're down to the same kind of issues again. We've got to get out there and do things to stop it. We just have to. That's the way it is. I remember during the minor strike when I was down in Plymouth, and uh, we invited some Welsh miners down and they were staying down. And uh, I, won't, I can't go into detail because even now it would, be, it would have repercussions. But their branch secretary came down and uh, in the middle of the night he said, oh, I'm going out. And it was all very furtive and they went out and we never knew what happened. A few weeks later I discovered they'd gone off to where a, a lorry, uh, a park where the lorries were being kept, that were the scab lorries moving the coal, and they torched every one of them. And that is Luddism, basically. That's, that's the same principle. When all else fails, we do that. Because we do not accept that when the human interest is up against the interest of the owner, or up against a piece of machinery, that that somehow is some sacred thing which cannot be interrupted. Because, it, you know, they, they, took, they call it violence now, don't they? If, if you, when you have a, you know, during the student rights, if a window gets smashed, it is presented to us on the television as an act of violence. It's only a window. It's only a bit of work for a glazier. I'm not saying it's good to have, you know, mass riots. I don't know, you know. But the, the point being that we've now internalised, I think it's been internalised for us, generally, is the idea that property is somehow sacred. And you can't question these things. And now it's gone on. It started with the defeat of the Luddites. They're saying the same things there. Progress. The word progress. The idea that if it exists technologically, we can do it, and we should do it, and we have to do it. And if I say no to nuclear, then I'm a Luddite. And if I say no to people redesigning plants, then patenting the genes so that every farmer in the world has to pay them money every time they grow a piece of wheat, which is why they've got a test crop incidentally growing in Britain at the moment for wheat, the, of GM wheat, the, the commodification of nature, the nuclear power and that, that there is only one way to resist it in the end, and that is to go and stop it. And that, well, that's not the only way, because actually that isn't enough, because obviously it's bigger things. So as Dave was saying, the context has to be changed, and it comes back to who's controlling it. Technology isn't neutral, as we, I think everyone here knows, but what matters is who's controlling it and how it's being brought in. And I understand that I'm going to have to face being arrested and things in order to resist the implementation of those technologies which I think are life-threatening. We're talking about in nuclear power, talk about injurious to the commonality. You know, this is something I've been looking for the planning uh, the, the whole planning thing, looking to put something in an objection. I've been looking at the waste management scenario, and I've taken the, to pieces all the words. They use a lot of abbreviations, they use a lot of language, which makes it very obscure. But when it comes down to it, what they're saying is, we don't know yet where we're going to put the waste, we think there's going to be a very big hole, and in 150 <laughs> years' time, which is 50 years after the nuclear power station has stopped operating, so you're talking about a generation of people who supposedly are still interested, who may or may not have the same society that we have, who may or may not have the same uh, security that we have, that they've got to go and go and go, OK, now how do we move this nuclear fuel to this hole, which may or may not exist in 150 years' time, where it has to be buried for uh, like 200,000 years so no one can disturb it by chance, which is longer than, there might be an ice age before then. That's the reality. So this is the technology that's being brought in to keep the system running because it is the easy option, and what they love about nuclear power is that when you get to that level of technocracy, it's very hard for people to interrupt it. Nuclear power workers can't withdraw their labour en masse. You can't leave a nuclear power station. You can't leave a nuclear waste depository. The future generation will have to deal with it, whether they like it or not, because if you leave it, it just gets hotter and hotter, and you have a nuclear accident. Once a nuclear power station is in place, you have to have a police state uh, uh, arrangement around it because you can't allow people to get in. So therefore, you have to have special laws. You have to have surveillance. All those things remain in place. And the energy which drives the capitalist system is completely and firmly under militarised control. 
It's being run by people who have to be experts, so most of us can't even understand what we can do about it. And you, you, you can't really interrupt it once it's running. We have to deal with it, which I think is why it's the preferred technology of this, of this time. You know, I was involved with the Vestas uh, occupation down at the Isle of Wight, where wind turbine workers were laid off. And it was really strange as an environmental campaigner to be going to, you know, the owners of that factory who were very keen, investors about their green credentials on the sort of the big level, the technological level. In reality, how they treated their workforce was the same as any other employer. And what they'd done was they got all these guys on overtime and that producing a huge stockpile of blades, and then they, they announced the redundancies. They were all laid off because they were going to America where there were currently subsidies at that time for, um, for turbines, so they were going there. Now they want to come back to Britain, provided the government offer them enough money, and they're, they're, they're doing that, which is also what the nuclear industry is now saying. Well, we may not invest unless you give us better tax breaks and, and more, invest, more uh, public subsidy. So they're always, the technology is always being used that way. And there is a meeting now between a meeting point between the environmental interest, which there was back then, but we were at the beginning of a process which we couldn't have imagined where it was going to lead. Now it's about the very survival of the biosphere. And at the same time, the issue that Dave was talking about, and sorry, I forgot your name. I've only just met you. Oh, Paul. Paul was talking about of who controls the technology and how that's being used. What's driving it is obviously the, the interest of, of private ownership. And therefore, that still has to be questioned. And therefore, the question becomes still, because I'm not one of those people that, you know, let's, the, the environmental movement has seen has sometimes, definitely what happened in the 80s, activists and 90s, activists said, okay, we're Luddites, good, we don't mind being called Luddites, but um, we're going to go out and do it. But that can't stop the kind of processes which are underway. Those processes are much bigger. And in the end, it's still going to be organised labour in one form or another. It's going to be social organisation of big campaigns which are actually going to stop those things. And I think that, that what I take from the Luddites, recently when I was, Mark Linus um, tried to insult people like me by calling us Green Luddites, and I wrote back and said I'm not worthy of that name. Because all I risk when I go out and take a bit of direct action, all I actually risk is being taken, I've been through it enough times, I know exactly what it is, you get taken to the police station, you spend a night in a cell, you go up in front of a magistrate, and they, because they don't want to appear too harsh, they say, well, you've been very naughty and here's a little fine, and then your friends pay it. I mean, that is basically the, the system we live in at the moment, how it's been operating against middle class, mainly, environmental activists. Not the same, obviously, if you're, you know, if you're involved in a, in a, a riot or a student riot in London. But that's, that's what I've experienced. So, it's, uh, I forgot my thread now, what was I saying about that? Which was, I've just ended, don't worry. Which was that... that that is, in itself, is great, but the, the point is, what I was said to Mark is, that to, to, to be called a Luddite, really, you're not worthy of the name because the Luddites were risking their lives. They were risking either exile or death. And that makes them, as I agree with Dave there, that, that makes them heroic and it makes them people who have to be commemorated properly, it should be, in your castle. But what we take, what I take from them as an activist is that they, they had incredible courage they weren't afraid. One of the things that shocks me about the world we live in now and about our society is, let's face it, we are quite affluent compared with the rest of the world. And poverty is always relative, so, you know, we are poor, a lot of us are poor, but compared with the rest of the world, there's this kind of material, there's a lot of stuff that we can get. And we have a lot of apparent freedom, you know, although the guys were stopped from leafleting in the, in the town today because they didn't have a licence. But we have, we have these kind of freedoms that we all know. <laughs> And we can say what we like in the paper and we, we, we're not going to get a visit from the police and get shot and our bodies thrown in the street as it happens in the rest of the world. But people, in, but people in this very privileged position, and this includes the working class, which to be honest now is probably most of us in the sense that, in the bigger sense, not the cultural sense, but in the sense that we're all just working for our dollar and we're all subject to the same employers, that basically we're a bit afraid of taking action. <coughs> That there is a lack of a lack of uh, a lack of feeling of ability to get out there and do stuff, a lack of ability to to organise the stuff, because we've been fragmented, because of the big defeats that have happened, and because we need to rediscover that spirit that the Luddites had, which is fearlessness and solidarity with each other. That they knew that they could trust each other, 
They knew that they could support each other. They weren't have individual aggrandizement. They didn't have a general love blog hoping he'd end up on a chat show and maybe write a book and be able to move out of the working class. What they had was solid, you know, which is what happens now, isn't it? What they had was the real solidarity and the real sense of we're all in this together. An injury to one is an injury to all, and we have got to, this is a life and death struggle. Well, we are now in a life and death struggle, but to some extent we're cushioned from it. And so it's hard for us to get it, and I'm hoping that by looking at the Luddites again and celebrating them again, we'll rediscover some of their fire, embrace that, that what they teach us, which is, yes, you should be prepared to stand up against property and the privilege of the owners. They are not sacred. What should be is that it's run for us and that we're at the centre of the picture, not profit and capital. But secondly, that it is about <coughs> rebuilding working class solidarity in the light of that and finding a way to end capitalism once and for all. Thanks. Great, thanks very much. Thanks to Paul and to Dave and to Theo. Um, I'm just going to say a couple of things uh, about the festival and then we'll get into the main discussion. Um, I mean, Theo, I just want to mention, uh, Theo raised this issue about sustainability and, you know, how, do we, how, how are we going to go forward with uh, sustainability and economic justice. And um, there is a session uh, happening uh, about that over at the Albert Hotel um, starting just about the moment this session ends. I just want to mention that you may have, there may be a mistake about that in session in your program. Um, the correct information about where and when that session is is in the summary table on the outside of your program. In the middle it says 3.30 at the library and that's wrong. Uh, anyway, so I just wanted to alert you to that. Um, Theo also uh, mentioned some stuff about uh, new technologies coming forward. There's another session um, which is about, uh, let's see, geoengineering, synthetic biology and nanotechnology, some of the new sweet technologies that are coming on for the basically the total, uh, total uh, manipulation of the, of the living world. Um, so that's, that's also happening. I also want to mention, um, uh, this is my moment to <laughs> more attention to this attractive item that I'm modelling. Um, uh, we've got more copies of it over there. They're, all, they're free trade organic uh, t-shirts, uh, very good quality, only 10 quid. Um, so please, uh, please buy those uh, and the mugs and other badges and stuff that we've got. Um, okay, I think that was the kind of announcements bit. Um, so what I want to... Uh, oops. Um, I want to uh, start the discussion by um, throwing out a bit of a challenge to something that Dave said at the end of his talk. Um, uh, and not, and I'm, I'm throwing this out not as, uh, you know, you're wrong, uh, but as a kind of, uh, try to push the discussion a bit further forward. I think we're kind of all used to the idea that um, yes, technology is not neutral, and that uh, the reason, the kinds of technologies we get, are dictated by the interests of capital. I think we're kind of used to that idea, and, and the, 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 fund, the fundamental thing there is that um, that uh, yeah, that technology, the design of technology, is led by certain material interests. Um, and you said you said at the end there that. Um, you know, when we have, I mean, uh, maybe I'm paraphrasing you, but more or less, uh, so industry is the friend of the working people, and, uh, and industrialism uh, actually is, is the friend of the working people. Um, and I think I, we, we don't know what, what, an, what industry would look like, uh, industri industry would look like in, in a socialist society. Um, one thing it certainly <coughs> look like is much more democratic control over what technology uh, we have. But one thing that I've learned from my kind of 20 years or so of, of campaigning around issues uh, on technology um, and science, particularly in the area of genetics, which is my thing, um, is that actually technology itself has its own in, in, in inherent criteria that are built into it, um, which actually in some ways dictate the way that capital behaves. 
um, actually. It has its own in, in built criteria of efficiency and streamlining. And so we see capital uh, often following that. So management always has to become scientific management uh, and use more scientific techniques in order to uh, you know, take on, take on the, uh, the ideas of science. Um, and you know, I, I sometimes feel that actually uh, the, the leader may, be, may in fact be science and technology rather than the interests of capital. So I just want to throw that out as a kind of um, something that you might like to discuss and respond to. We can kick it around the room and there'll be other questions too. So that's the first thing. Um, so, do you want to respond directly, Dave? Or? I mean, there's so many things I could respond to, particularly with this comrade here. Um, I think we'd probably need a whole weekend to talk about questions of technology, and in particular, <coughs> being a coal miner and supporter of clean coal technology, carbon capture and storage, for example. I suspect we would tend to disagree mm. o o over, over some of that, maybe. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's also illustrative that all of the prohibitions on protest that you're talking about actually came in to defend the windmills and the wind farms so that um, to get the plan of permission through by local protesters who didn't want them so you weren't allowed to object for example you're not allowed to object to them just because you don't like them mm. so that's out so just because they're, they're destroying places of outstanding natural beauty that's out because it we've, we've signed up to a deal that says you're going to have them so you're going to have them mm. So, and all of that, and the people who cheerled that, unfortunately, are now the people who are objecting to the nuclear power stations when they're using the same arguments against protests for the nuclear power stations but that were used to get through uh, wind farms. And don't be surprised if they don't start building nuclear power stations in the highlands of Scotland and in the lowlands of Scotland as they've done with the wind farms, because nobody lives there. So there won't be anybody there to object to them because they'll say, well, you know, the number of people who object is only that many. You know, so I mean, there the, are the lots of things tied up with it, but what is absolutely sure is this, <laughs> is that energy, the energy that we need will have to be determined not by a group of people who've decided for us that they know the answer, whether that's in the environmental and green movement or whether it's the ruling class, it will be dependent, will be decided by working people themselves. That's the only democratic way to do it. Yeah. And when we know what our objectives are and what our requirements are, what are the conditions in, in which energy is produced? What are the long-term needs for humanity? Um, all of those questions, but the question of, of energy is who controls energy? <coughs> so say we can agree on that. Who controls the energy? What is it for? What are we trying to do with it? And where do we go with it? Um, th those, are, those are essentially the points that tie in. And you can't separate energy, the environment, because it's always put forward as if it's an abstraction. I mean, the environment's where we live, as a matter of fact. It's no more or less than that. The environment's where we live. Uh, all of those things are tied in with who controls, who says, what is the priority? Why do, why do millions of children die before their first birthday in the world? Why is that not a priority when lots of other frivolous bloody priorities of balance of payments and stuff is? I mean, all of this is one question. You know, and the answer to that is the workers of the world need to take control of the resources of the world and allocate them in the best way that we can for the benefit of the people of the world. Okay. But he um, didn't answer your question. <laughs> Not precisely. Well, I think no. it's tied in with but the question of industry. Right. Yeah, yeah. Industry yeah. to me is what people do. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, well, I could, yeah, I could. But let, let, let's have some questions and comments on any of the talks. Uh, yeah. Come on, someone's got to I've got, um, Something that's going in my head, it's not very well formed, is that you, you haven't really mentioned um, the military and armament, because it seems to me that that's where masses and masses of profit is made. Mm -hmm. um, particularly in America, I think, isn't like half their domestic product armaments? And who are they using them against? I, 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 it's not very well, well thought out, but just thinking that's all part of it, isn't it? Can, can I say something about that? The, I think the only thing I really disagreed with Theo, well, I think you were a bit, a bit too relaxed about the state, what the state would be prepared to do to people. I think you should ask the relatives of Hilda Morrell uh, whether mm. the state would shoot somebody or get rid of somebody. And I, I think they don't like to do it in, in an open way, but no. they do do it 
Yeah. Can I just, uh, just before, because just... I just don't walk after you. Oh, no. No, yeah, just because, no, no, just cause in case I'm getting characterised here in ways I didn't like by the two, two here. First of all, <laughs> the people who are opposing nuclear, really, the people who are opposing nuclear were not involved in wanting the national planning system. That is not. There might be, there might be some people, but, you know, when we're talking about the resistance to nuclear, actually, in the communities where it's in Somerset, where it's mm -hmm. actually where we're facing it. We're not people who said, oh, we should have a steamroller method. You know, that isn't what people wanted for wind farms. It may be that there's a wind farm lobby who wanted that. That's a different issue. Of course, there will always be one capitalist lobby who want this, one who want that, and they will be happy when it's used here but not here. But that's not the issue with quite for environmentalists as a whole. We didn't, I don't think you'd say the environmentalists asked for there to be a less democratic planning system because that isn't the friend of anyone who wants to defend a piece of land near you. If you want to defend it, it isn't your friend when it becomes less democratic. And on that, I'm not saying I'm naive about the lengths to which the system will go to crush people who are dangerous. I'm not at all naive about that. I, my little moniker on the Guardian, which I can't unfortunately shake because I don't understand new technology enough, so having once put it up on a Guardian comment thread, I can no longer get rid of it. Whenever I put my email address, this moniker comes up, which is Who Killed Kelly, which is a bit dated now, but that's because at the time I wanted everyone to remember that, that Kelly was killed. And so I, I understand that, and I I'm, I'm just want to say that. I'm not naive, and I'm not naive about the way that the police will behave when told to against sections of the population. All I'm saying is we live in a time where we have the benefit of a certain amount of relaxed liberal law in a very privileged country and that what we're not doing is using that opportunity to come to the aid of the international working class who exist under much worse conditions, you know, where trade unions do get shot and that we, we need to use the power that we have to rectify that situation, that's all I'm saying. You know that Greece um, increased its military spending this year in the last 12 months by 50%. And where are they buying the stuff from? Up Germany. Of course. <laughs> That's in turn for the wall. <laughs> That's an odd story as well. No, yeah. I, I just like to make a small point, but I think a significant point about how the way Luddites are seen. Because as I grew up in sort of technology and sort of the big thing, Luddites were seen as awful people destroyed it. When I'm a social worker, I work in an office, and so sort of, I come in late sort of, like mornings, and I come into the clutter of keyboards, which is not what the social worker is about. But certainly people in my office um, don't like the computers, and they don't see being a mother as being negative. And I think that's true for a lot of people. You know, they, they, they want technology, but they don't want technology that oppresses them. And they know that it's the bosses that are using technology to oppress them. And that's, I think, not in a lot of places. And I think the perception of being a mother has changed. Yeah. 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 I think that's it's important changed. to recognize. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 one thing we've noticed through, you know, uh, doing these events over the last year, you know, to celebrate this anniversary, is the extraordinarily large degree of exactly that kind of um, general sort of Luddite uh, sentiment out there, you know, about all kinds of uh, uh, technology that is used to, uh, to oppress people. Yeah, people, people really do understand it. That, and at the same time, yeah, I mean, particularly with the digital technology, they can see they can see that it has real benefits for their lives. But yeah, so it's on a kind of on a knife edge. But people are yeah, there's an awful lot of that out there. Yeah. But and, but then again, going back, the decisions that are made on your behalf by other people. I mean, like the, the switch, the big switch over on the telly, you know, from from the uh, from the from the ordinary. Who asked us? Who asked us about that? Mm. Who, who said that we should all tell you they're going to turn off and <coughs> six months' time you won't be able to get the, uh, the uh, what do you call it, channel? The, the, I know what channel you call it, yeah. Um, the, is it analog? Oh, yeah, yeah, the analog channel. Well, you know, like, <coughs> I've made views and television stuff like that. Who, who made that decision and why? It's all to do with corporate decisions that they, you're going to have this. And there's, there's a, mul a, a million and one other decisions that are made like that every single day. Without, and, and, and we don't get the, and people take for granted that they make these decisions for us. People were far more questioning. hundred years ago, people were far more mm. questioning about, about decisions that were, that were made on our behalf, and people were prepared to challenge them and, and ask a simple question like, who are you? Who are you? Who told you you could do that? But now people thought, you know, it's not for us to, 
the question. A lot more forelock touching now than we've been yeah. ever in my history. It's true, it's true because when you get the sense when you look at the Luddites that when well you know it that when when a mill owner uh, or a you know a master crow whatever when they were bring, thinking of bringing a frame in or they brought a frame in then they were getting they knew their community was saying to them you don't do that and for a long a lot of them didn't because or just one one breaking of one machine was enough to send a message yeah. just like you're not going to do it and they knew that they couldn't overstep that line eventually and in a way the struggle was between that and the new order, which was, we will overstep any line we want in the interest of capital, and you've got no power to stop us, you know. But now, you've got a situation where, if they say, if somebody says, we're going to build a Tesco's here, we all, we all, we, we can make our objections, but basically, well, that's the way it is, isn't it? They can do whatever they like. So in that way, we're less free, it's true, we're less free in our yeah. attitude. Yeah, I mean, I just mentioned that, um, uh, this, that, on that theme, that one of the Luddite songs, one of the key lines in... General Ludd's triumph is that it was the foul imposition alone that produced these unhappy effects. It was the way that the manufacturers were imposing the technology. Um, thank you. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I consider myself quite old and, and, and sort of given up on revolutionary politics over a period of time and then come back and then down and bloody out again. <laughs> um, as, as a teacher, I, I'm just appalled by the general education of our younger generation coming through. I mean, it's no good talking about political, because there's no political in education at all. It hasn't been for a long time. But it's, it's, it's worse than ever. They, you, you just, somebody just broached on television. Television hasn't got an apath of politics in it. I haven't got a television. I, I, can, I can easily not have a television. The only bit of information I try and filter through to myself is through the internet. But I, I, I just, it's lovely to hear, especially from you at the end there, <coughs> the kind of language and the kind of uh, <coughs> keenness of somebody that's in there fighting and they're still going strong or, <coughs> or power to you but I, I see you're talking about freedom and education I see us as a country I mean I, I was out in China in 79 and I could, could see then that they were coming up and the power that was potentially there and latent there. But here, and I've been through it as, as uh, what, 10, 15, 20 years as a math teacher, and I see us going down, relatively speaking. And um, where, where the hell are we going to be in 10 years' time? No, we're, going, we're, going, we're getting less freedom that you, you brought out in, in various ways, less freedom. And more apathy. You can't talk to a kid now. My son, who's 30, who's got a degree, he doesn't want to know about politics. I, I, I spoke to him on the phone and it, saying, Why did you come down? It's a really interesting thing about the Luddites. <laughs> Can I say something? And, he, yeah. and, and, so and, and, and he's all he's bothered about. Do you know what, do you know what he. He's got a bloody degree, and, and, and he said he's only had one job in his life that it was worth getting out of bed for, and that was being helping drug, uh, drug people. Yeah. And, 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 well, and this, this, is, this, this is a, this is a, a brilliant, potentially brilliant citizen of this country. Who wanted to go into education and do something, and seeing it all bloody fall apart? What's, what's? I mean, what's your answer? Where, where's the way well, forward? Where's the it. bloody way? I'm ready to sign up. No, what I'm saying is, there's two things. You're wrong about television. You said there's not an ape of the politics. It's full of politics. It's absolutely full of right-wing politics. Yeah. And it's like, oh, Chom well, yeah. it's like Chomsky yeah, says, right the debate politics. should be about A to Z. 
and television makes the debate about A to B. Always makes it. If you're outside A to B, you can't speak. But in Bradford West, they had a debate outside of A to B, didn't they? Yeah. Whatever the media said, they had a debate in Bradford West. And that's, that's where the issue is. Because it doesn't matter that you don't want to find politics. Politics is finding you. For no local government officer that started work when I did in 1973, or very few of them, wanted to find politics. But politics is finding them. Because somebody's saying, you're knackered, you've got to work another 10 years. Mm -hmm. And by the way, who would have dreamt when I started working in 1973, when there were dozens of collieries around Pontefract and Wakefield and Selby, who would have dreamt that the accident emergency department at Pontefract General Infirmary from October has started shutting from 8 o'clock at night till 8 o'clock in the morning? Mm -hmm. Near the biggest pit in Britain, Kelly Lake and chemical factories all over Castleford, some of them which blow up on a regular basis, and the accident emergency on there has, has been shut for six months of a night. That politics has found them people, hasn't it? And they, they, they have no choice, you can't. You need a lot of money to avoid politics. Mm. Oh, fine. Uh, I agree with you. Wait, I'm going to say, sorry. sorry, I think, go on, Jim. Yeah, uh, really, uh, Dave, I'm really sorry I missed your talk. It wasn't, I didn't say, oh, Dave's address, I know what you would say. Uh, <laughs> you know what I said, anyway. I completely <laughs> cocked up. Were you sorry that you missed mine? Sorry? Were you sorry that you missed mine? Uh, I, in retrospect, yes. Yeah, thank you. I <laughs> 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 think you were right to me. <laughs> so, He's um, here. Yeah. <laughs> Go on. And so really, I'm answering the question Dave posed, I'm trying to contribute to the question Dave posed to you. Um, Theo was there when we commemorated the Diggers' 350th anniversary in 1999. And one of the things when Stanley wrote after this was all over, when he was trying to write a utopia, was he, he wanted to encourage and look forward to the invention of new machines to take the backbreaking labour out of agricultural work, because mm -hmm. he knew all about that, you know, and they all knew what it was like. I mean, to, uh, of course, that was in the context of a utopia where the earth had become a common treasury for all. In, you know, they didn't use the term capitalism, but that's what he was, he was talking about. Um, and the way they saw it was, the way he saw it was that taking the backbreaking labor out of producing food would free people to have so much more space and time in their lives for learning and for culture and, and so on. I mean, that's a vision, you know, that was for very strong the in the 19th century, yeah. you know. Mm. Uh, and it's always been anticipated that new technology, industrialization, would create that liberation, but it never has. Mm. And industrialization made life even more grim. And I mean, in all human development, it's taken, it requires more and more time just to survive. Mm. If you go right back to, to uh, Mesolithic times, uh, it's thought that they spent about a quarter of the time that we spend just to meet the basic needs. They have much more time for fun than we do. Um, so, they didn't live very long, Nick. Sorry? They didn't live very long, Nick. Uh, I don't know if that's true. It isn't the case. Um, mm. So, I mean, that's my thought on industrialization. It's always held out this promise of liberation, more time, more, uh, you know, enable us to expand and grow as people and as communities. And it's always a Johnny promise that turns out to be the opposite of that. Um, I, I don't know if that's absolutely true either, in, in absolute terms. I mean, when I look back to the... Uh, to the 60s and the 70s in the coal industry, right? When, when we defeated the Heath government twice, yeah, yeah. and when, when, when Arthur Scargill walked on water, and, uh, and, and the unions had a little more, more edge than we've got now. Nobody ever worked the Monday, yeah. you know? Or oh, maybe they didn't work the Friday. You so tended Monday. to get four in, yeah. you know? And if they sat there for absenteeism, well, every couple of weeks, now they send you back again. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we had a lot more edge then, and, and, and in terms of production, because we had a, we'd fought for and got a national power loading agreement which paid us the weekly, which people did the work that they thought was about reasonable, you know, everybody tried to put the whip on your back with getting out, you know, and, and, and we dictated who worked where, 
we, when the men signed on at the pit, they came to our office first, came to the union office first, put their name on the, on the road to the union plan who, went, who work, worked in one place. We decided who worked overtime. We decided how much overtime would be worked, by who. So, they did, they, so, so it's not in absolute terms true, and it's always that way. We've now gone backwards, of course. Yeah. From, from, and, 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 the, and the Durham and Northumberland Coal from the 19th century, <coughs> coal here was worked six hours a day. Now the poor buggers at Kelmley are working ten hours. Yeah. <coughs> Compulsorily. You haven't got any choice about the matter. So, you know, it, it, things go backwards as well as forwards. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's what uh, Jim, that's sorry, what strong union does. Jim, I'm sorry, sorry I'm going to have to stop you. We are actually on our time. There was one person who I stopped, so I definitely want to... talk about politics finding you, how politics found the Luddites. And, and I'm thinking back to the march for jobs that I was on and looking for the pension, and there was a real ground of opinion of people wanting to be part of it. When you've got such a... Iconic imagery around us like Ned Lawn and Enoch's mm -hmm. Hammer and the rest of it. When are the unions going to put something that will engage people again to do what they need to do to serve the jobs? It's a very sanitised affair sometimes to come to one of these marches. There are no brass bands, there are no banners mm -hmm. like the world of miners. I think passion needs putting back into it, and that's what we're looking for. And that's when young people will be very much engaged in politics. And I think this is really something that will be extremely valuable, and I can move as a teacher, take this certainly back into the classroom. I just want to say that to you, that I think that's what we A thousand people went to watch George Galloway speak a week last mm -hmm. Tuesday. A thousand people. Now, in the 1970s, there were plenty of politicians that could draw a thousand people, weren't there? Oh, yeah. Tony Benn, Eric Keffer, yeah. you could all list them, couldn't you? Yeah. And you couldn't. It's them that's behind the times. It's absolutely the leaders that were behind the times, because the people are waiting for them people, aren't they? They're waiting yeah, for that sort of leadership. Can I just, 14th of July, the Durham Miners Gala. Oh, yeah. Be in Durham City from 8 o'clock. There were 90,000 people there last year. The biggest labour movement parade in Europe. And we need that again. Yeah. Okay, that's Thank great. That's a brilliant note to end on. Um, and uh, in fact, I mean, uh, of course, people can hang around here afterwards and. Uh, well, actually, only for about 10 minutes we've got the oh. <laughs> uh, And there are other events starting now. In fact, I've got to rush off myself to one. But I just want to thank all our speakers very much indeed. And um, uh, remind you again that the uh, merchandise stall is there. And we really need you to buy the stuff and make your donations because we have spent a lot of money on organising this festival. We need to get some of it back. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, and sir. thanks again for the, to the speakers. Thank you.